Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. And I, I will, I will say again what I said in 2011. Gay rights are human rights, and human rights are gay rights once and for all. citizens from the violence and oppression of a hateful foreign ideology. Believe me. Every American has a unique identity. I am proud to be gay. I am proud to be a Republican. Most of all, I am proud to be an American! Hi, this is Pastor Jonathan Shelley from Steadfast Baptist Church in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. And the point of this documentary is to demonstrate the sodomite deception that's been infecting our culture, it's been infecting our nation, it's been infecting our churches. And I want to expose the truth of the sodomites according to the Word of God, not what the world has to say. We see that the news media, the television, we see that the school districts, we see the education, we see even in churches that the Word of God is not being thundered forth on this issue. And so people have been greatly deceived on the sodomites. And so the point of this documentary is to demonstrate what the Bible has to say and how America and society as a whole has shifted its view dramatically. The Bible says the wicked walk on every side when the vilest men are exalted. Now that's what we see in our nation today, that's what we see in our culture, where the vilest type of people, sodomites, homosexuals, those that are deviant and perverts, they're constantly praised and lifted up in the society. And the Bible says when a culture elevates these type of people and praises these type of people, you're gonna see evil walking on every single side. The Bible also warns that, yea, in all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But we need to stand firm on the Word of God and not let the deception come and taint our view or try to persuade us to not stand fast on the truths of the Bible. I think something that a lot of Christians have forgotten is the fact that the Word of God has not changed and the Word of God will never change. And so I want to encourage them to stand fast on the truths of the Bible no matter how much the world deviates or perverts the truths of God's Word. But one thing's undeniable, America has been rapidly changing over the last few decades. Across the country, protests, police lines, and petitions, all in a battle over books, or rather, who is reading books to children in a literacy program called Drag Queen Story Hour. This public library here in Virginia Beach, Virginia, recently hosted an event called Drag Queen Story Hour, and we witnessed parents taking their children as young as two inside to take part. At this defining moment, change has come to America.
It was God's law that influenced the settlers and was prevalent in colonial America. The following is a brief tour of U.S. history, which will demonstrate that sodomy laws were a regular part of society, and they were based on the Bible. In South Carolina, the English colony specifically cites the Buggery Statute of 1533 as a basis for the South Carolina law. In other words, they were subject to the death penalty. Henry VIII enacted the first English statute against homosexuality in 1533. This law made it a capital felony for any person to commit the detestable and abominable vice of buggery with mankind or beast. The law remained unchanged from 1563 to 1861, just about 300 years. So for virtually 300 years in England, it was always put to death for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. And these are the people that gave you, you know what book? This one, the King James Bible, the Word of God. They gave you all kinds of other English versions at that time too. The laws of the colony of Virginia, enacted in 1612, says in section 9, No man shall commit the horrible and detestable sins of sodomy upon pain of death. The Lord Baltimore of Maryland received a charter to establish laws as long as they were agreeable and not contrary to the laws of England. In 1632, England had the abominable act of buggery listed as a crime worthy of death. Anyone guilty of one of the capital offenses on this list were liable to death, drawn up by the Plymouth County in 1636. These included treason, murder, witchcraft, arson, sodomy, rape, buggery, and adultery. That sounds familiar. If you just read the Bible, it's like basically the same list. Basically, they just read the Bible and said, hey, let's just believe this. That's why the Bible says in Psalms 19, the law of the Lord is perfect. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure of making wise the simple. You want to be wise today? You want to follow God's laws. You want to look at the great lawgiver. Now it's amazing that 1600 years after the Lord Jesus Christ, they can still look back and say, you know what, we should follow the Old Testament. But today, new Christianity says, oh, that's Old Testament. Well, how come for the first 1,600 years of Christianity, they kept looking at the Old Testament and using it? Were they all wrong? The Massachusetts Bay Colony identified sodomy as one of 12 capital crimes in 1641. Section 8 of its law stated, If any man lieth with mankind as he lieth with a woman, both of them have committed abomination. They both shall surely be put to death. The Blue Laws of Connecticut, enacted in 1647, states the following in section 7. If any man lieth with mankind, as he lieth with woman, both of them have committed abomination. They both shall surely be put to death. That sounds familiar. That's literally what the law said. They said, hey, let's just take what God said, put it in our law, and believe it. But to, it's like, where did we go, where did we go wrong? What happened? The New Haven Law of 1655 stated, If any man lie with mankind as he lieth with a woman, both of them have committed abomination. They both shall surely be put to death. Leviticus 2013 is listed as a citation in this law. The law continues, And if any woman change the natural use into that which is against nature, as Romans 1.26, she shall be liable to the same sentence and punishment. How is it that the Christians that founded our nation when they wrote our laws, they're literally writing Leviticus 20:13 and Romans 1 in the same paragraph? And then today, when we actually get up and preach it, you're teaching something new. Y'all are a cult. Y'all are starting some kind of a cult. No one's ever believed this. The colony of New Jersey enacted this law in 1668. It says, If any man lieth with mankind as he lieth with a woman, they both shall be put to death. The preamble to the Connecticut Laws of 1672 stated the following, The serious consideration of the necessity of the establishment of wholesome laws 
for the regulating of each body politic, hath inclined us mainly in obedience unto Jehovah the great lawgiver, who hath been pleased to set down a divine platform not only of the moral, but also of judicial laws suitable for the people of Israel. So they said, you know what? God gave great laws to Israel. They were so wonderful. I guess that's where we should get our laws to. We're starting a nation. Where should we look to to get some laws? They say, you know what? Let's just look to the Bible. Let's look to the laws of the Jews. Let's look to the great lawgiver of Jehovah. That's what they said. The following appeared in the first published laws of Rhode Island in 1719. And be it enacted by the authority aforesaid, that whosoever shall perpetrate and commit the detestable and abominable crimes of sodomy or buggery, and be thereof legally convicted, shall suffer the pains of death, as in cases of felony, with benefit of clergy. According to homosexuals and the death penalty in colonial America, in 1776, male homosexuals in the original 13 colonies were universally subject to the death penalty. You say, what was America like back then? It sounds a lot better. They actually believe the Bible. To not want to put these people to death, you're deceived today. The Bible's laws are great. They're wonderful. That's what the Bible teaches. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 5. Behold, I have taught you statutes and judgments, even as the Lord my God commanded me, that ye should do so in the land whither ye go to possess it. Keep therefore and do them. For this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations, which shall hear all these statutes. Notice this, all these statutes, every single one of them, and say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. You know when they heard Leviticus 20:13, they said, this is a wise and understanding people. This is great. That's what they say. Look at verse 7. What nation is there so great who hath God so nigh unto them, as the Lord our God is in all things that we call upon him for? And what nation is there so great that has statutes and judgments, notice this, so righteous as all this law which I set before you? He says when people look at the laws of God, you know what they say? That's righteous, that's great, that's wonderful, how awesome. I mean, they, they're just in awe of the laws of God saying, what a great society to live in. But you have Christians today, they look at the laws of the Old Testament with disgust. They say, I can't believe you, you think those people should be put to death. That's so evil, that's so wicked. No, you're evil, you're wicked. You have a defiled mind. Never speak against God's laws. The law of the Lord is perfect. I like all of them. I look at them with awe and wonder, and I say, how great are those laws? I wish we had those laws. You know what? I'm not gonna apologize for wanting all these people to be put to death. It's wonderful. It's righteous. It's great. What a great society we could live in. So for hundreds and hundreds of years, we believe the Bible is a nation, then it starts to weaken. Then they stop putting to death, then they start just giving them life in prison. I'll just kind of shorten, I'll give you the shortened version. In 1800, the Virginia legislature reduced the penalty for sodomy. A new statute set a penalty of one to 10 years imprisonment for free persons who commit the act, either as principal or as an accessory. An 1807 Indiana Territory law stated the following, Sodomy with man or beast shall be fined from fifty to five hundred dollars, whipped from one to five hundred lashes, imprisoned from one to five years, rendered infamous and shall neither give evidence or hold any office. In 1838, Arkansas instituted the first statute against homosexual activity with a provision which read, Every person convicted of sodomy or buggery will be imprisoned in the state penitentiary for not less than five years nor more than 21 years. Florida's first specific sodomy law was enacted in 1868 and made sodomy a felony. The law stated, 
Whosoever commits the abominable and detestable crime against nature, either with mankind or with beast, shall be punished by imprisonment in the state prison not exceeding 20 years. I looked up, you know what the police used to do? They used to raid all these sodomite places and put them in jail. I looked it up in 1903 in New York City, the, the police department raided the Airston bathhouse and arrested many of them and put them in jail. In 1918 in San Francisco, they had the Baker Street raid. In 1929, they had the Turkish bathhouses in New York City raid. In LA in 1959, they had the Cooper's Donuts. Donut shop in the morning, filthy, disgusting hellhole at night. They came and arrested many of these sodomite freaks. You know, there was this documentary going out by the LA Police Department in 1961 called Boys Beware. They literally make a whole documentary exposing how sodomites are trying to take boys and do things to them and harm them and hurt them. And they say it's a sickness of the mind. They say, if you're a sodomite, you're sick in the mind. What Jimmy didn't know was that Ralph was sick, a sickness that was not visible like smallpox but no less dangerous and contagious, a sickness of the mind. You see, Ralph was a homosexual, a person who demands an intimate relationship with members of their own sex. You have problems. They said, beware of men that are too friendly. You know what, the, the LA Police Department, they understood that flattery's wicked. <laughs> I mean, it's like, how can the world believe the Bible and we don't believe? The decision is always yours, and your whole future may depend on making the right one. So no matter where you meet a stranger, be careful if they are too friendly, if they try to win your confidence too quickly, and if they become overly personal. One never knows when the homosexual is about. He may appear normal, and it may be too late when you discover he is mentally ill. So keep with your group. And don't go off alone with strangers unless you have the permission of your parent or teacher. In 1966, they had the 21st Street Baths houses. Police raid in San Francisco. Again, in San Francisco another year, the Gene Compton Cafe. In LA in 1967, they had the Black Cat, they arrested them. In 1969, the LA Police Department arrested a Dover Hotel. In 1969, the New York Police Department arrested them in the Stonewall Inn. In 1970, in New York, they arrested a bunch of sodomites in the Snake Pit. That's an interesting name. All these devils. You know how many they, they arrested? 167 sodomites in these bathhouses. So the police are literally hearing that there's a, a sodomite bathhouse. They go in and arrest them and put them in jail. But in 1976, the California state legislation finally made a law that it was illegal for the police department to raid bathhouses. That's when it starts changing. This baby boomer generation, they think they're so clean in their own eyes and they're not washed from their own filthiness. Letting all this filth and abomination come into this country is disgusting. You know, I refer to homosexual marriage as sodomy-based marriage. This is a marriage, pseudo-marriage. It's counterfeit marriage, fake marriage, not the real thing. It's Naugahyde marriage. And, and it is rooted in the, 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 the act of sodomy, which was a felony offense everywhere in the United States of America. Everywhere in the United States, it was a felony offense, capital offense a lot of places, until 1962. Then Illinois, I believe, got rid of their sodomy statute. It was still a felony offense in the other 49 states until 1972. And then finally, the sexual revolution began to crumble, erode the pillars of American morality. And, it's, and, and now uh, you talk about uh, preserving public policies against this behavior. You get tagged as a homophobic bigot for advocating the moral position that all of America took for virtually all of our history. Most Americans are repelled by the mere notion of homosexuality. The CBS News survey shows that two out of three Americans look upon homosexuals with disgust, discomfort, or fear. One out of ten says hatred. A vast majority believe that homosexuality is an illness. Only 10% say it is a crime. And yet, and here's the paradox, 
the majority of Americans favor legal punishment, even for homosexual acts performed in private between consenting adults. The homosexual, bitterly aware of his rejection, responds by going underground. They frequent their own clubs and bars and coffee houses where they can act out in the fashion that they want to. Homosexuality is, in fact, a mental illness which has reached epidemiological proportions. The CBS News Public Opinion Survey indicates that sentiment is against permitting homosexual relationships between consenting adults without legal punishment. In 2003, is the final time in America where there wasn't any laws against sodomy. That is not that long ago. So they just weakened and deteriorated and got smaller and smaller till eventually in Houston, Texas. In Houston, Texas, a guy was arrested for being a sodomite. But in 2003, the Supreme Court basically ruled the Constitution, you know, it was unconstitutional to have laws against sodomy. So what happened from 2003 to 2019? Did we have a great spiritual awakening? Oh, we just realized the Bible never taught that, you know. Oh, we just finally got more godly. I see our country getting more wicked by the second. I'm afraid of the bobsled to hell we're on. I feel like we were on that roller coaster. It was like... I mean, it's just going straight down. The Lawrence versus Texas case prevented state governments from enacting new sodomy laws and effectively rendered such laws that were already on the books as unenforceable. The court claimed that banning sodomy furthered no legitimate state interest and represented a, quote, intrusion into the personal and private life of the individual. In 2010, the Club Dallas in Dallas, Texas, had a complaint and officers came in and arrested a bunch of sodomites and guess what happened the next week? The officers got fired. That wasn't that long ago. But of course, I'm the crazy one, right? You're the crazy one for believing the Bible, even though the police department, not long ago, is literally arresting these people, arresting these freaks, okay? Now, all of a sudden, if you get up and say that it's, you know, disgusting and wicked and vile, you'll lose your job. You will see a time in which we as a nation finally recognize relationships between two men or two women as just as real and admirable as relationships between a man and a woman. In 2015, the Supreme Court of the United States ruled that the right to marry should be extended to homosexuals. The 5-4 decision altered the legal definition of marriage and was widely regarded as a victory for progressive identity politics. Following the decision, all 50 states were mandated to issue homosexual marriage licenses, making such documents just as legally binding as those associated with heterosexual couples. The last decade has been full of LGBTQ milestones, from gay marriage to trans rights to a rainbow wave across state and local governments. Brooks Apelsa, editorial director of NBC Out, is with me now. I think the pace in which we've seen political LGBTQ representation has been, um, I mean, the past 10 years has been probably more so than we've had for the previous five decades. I think in order to understand the massive impact that the 2015 landmark ruling had, you have to understand where we were at the beginning of the decade. On January 1st, 2010, only five states had legalized same-sex marriage, wow. and more than two dozen had explicit bans on gay marriage. We are required to do our part to stand up change the law, the policies that for too long have denied people of equality, stripped them of their dignity, put them in harm's way. And think about the progress we've made today. We have so much more to do. What happened? You've been deceived into thinking that they're normal. What changed? Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So you have to believe that Christians for literally thousands of years have been wrong. Now we're right. Now in the last decade, we finally got it right. And just love them and treat them with respect. The Bible says in Malachi 3, for I am the Lord, I change not. The Bible says in Psalms 119, forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. God does not change. You know what he said? They shall surely be put to death. That's the Bible. And he doesn't change. His opinion is the same beyond time. Before time, 
after time, during time. It's all the same. Put him to death. How can a Christian not argue for the death penalty? You despise God's word. People ought to be free to enter into any kind of union they wish. I'm announcing today a change of heart uh, on an issue that um, a lot of people feel strongly about. It has to do with uh, gay couples' opportunity to marry. My record in Congress for over six years uh, shows my commitment to fighting for LGBTQ equality. We today pass the Equality Act and finally fully end discrimination against LGBTQ Americans. The Equality Act has the support of a majority of the American people in every state. The fight for LGBTQ rights is a fight for civil rights, and until all of us are equal, none of us are equal, and none of us will receive justice. Why is the United States of America not using its power on the world to begin to stand up on the global stage against the outrageous violence and discrimination against LGBTQ uh, 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 citizens around the world? We have to make the U.S. a world leader again in LGBTQ equality. Today, a historic day and a major milestone for the LGBTQ community. The Supreme Court ruled that LGBTQ employees cannot be discriminated against at work, not legally anyway. The idea that an eight-year-old child or a 10-year-old child decides, you know, I decided I want to be transgender. That's what I think I'd like to be. It may make my life a lot easier. There should be zero discrimination. GOP leaders against gay marriage appear to get that their opposition has become a minority view in America, and they're increasingly careful to strike a more tolerant tone. We've got the town hall with Pete Buttigieg. Don't you think it's just great to see the fact that you've got a guy there um, on the stage with his husband, and it's normal, it's not even... I think it's absolutely deal. fine, I do. I think it's great. I think that's... Uh, Something that perhaps some people will have a problem with. I have no problem with it whatsoever. I think it's good. So if Caitlyn Jenner were to walk into Trump Tower and want to use the bathroom, you would be fine with her using any bathroom she chooses? That is correct. This president is proud that in 2019, we uh, launched a global initiative to end the criminalization of homosexuality throughout the world. Um, he has a great record when it comes uh, to the LGBT community. Uh, the Trump administration eased a ban on blood donations from gay and bisexual men, uh, and he launched a plan to end the AIDS epidemic by 2030. America was not the way it was five minutes ago, 10 years ago, 50 years ago. It is much different much different. And my question is, why are we embracing all this change as Christians? Did the Bible change? Did the Bible radically change 10 years ago? My King James Bible hasn't changed a word since it was translated in 1611, period. So why in the world is everything changing? It's not from God, that's for sure. You know it's coming from? The working of Satan. He's deceiving people, thinking all oh, this normal now. The Stonewall Riots of 1969 took place after New York City police raided a sodomite club located in Greenwich Village in New York City. The civil unrest that ensued is widely regarded as a backlash against sodomy laws and the general consensus on homosexuality at the time. After midnight, six undercover police officers entered the bar and soon after, the raid began. The bar was shut down by law enforcement, but the sodomites began rioting in response. First by throwing bottles at the police, and soon after, they began taunting officers, throwing more objects at them and slashing the tires of police vehicles outside the venue. Things eventually settled down sometime after 4 a.m. Although no one died or was critically injured, a few police officers reported injuries. So, you know, in the 60s and 70s, police used to raid gay nightclubs and bars, and they would go and arrest them and basically take them to jail because they were doing a lot of criminal activity. But in this specific instance in New York City, this is the first time where the gay community basically responded. They started rioting, and they started parading up and down the streets, and they tried to talk about the injustice of them being persecuted by the police departments. 
The Gay Liberation Front was the name first chosen following the riots to describe the organization of homosexuals who came together to assert their, quote, pride, which is how they branded their civil rights movement. This pushback led to more state laws against sodomy being revoked and the attempted normalization of homosexuality, which set the stage for the general public to see more sodomites on television and in the media. The ripple effect of Stonewall was that more sodomites felt compelled to, quote, come out. And if more of them came out, more of them would end up in the spotlight where they could influence the masses. David, Very doing? nice to meet you. Same here. He calls himself Tree Sequoia. He was a 30-year-old bartender when police raided the Stonewall. We knew it was another raid, but all of a sudden we heard a crash and somebody threw a rock through the window. But this time, Stonewall patrons resisted arrest. The violence escalated, and eventually hundreds of people joined in. And the gay liberation movement is challenging a society that abhors homosexuality. In New York, as in most other states, the law, known as the sodomy statute, provides that even in private, consenting adults may not engage in deviant conduct, which includes homosexual behavior. Through demonstrations and political and educational pressure, the gay liberation movement is fighting to change the law and all other forms of what they consider discrimination. As conservative groups fought for a legislative solution known as Proposition 6, the sodomites were emboldened to fight against it. This piece of legislation would protect children from sodomite indoctrination in schools. This proposition is a referendum statewide on the rights of parents to determine who will be a proper role model for their children in the California classrooms. But what it does do is give school boards new authority to uh, remove from the classroom a teacher who is pushing homosexuality to the point that the school board believes they could go to court and make it hold up in court that that teacher was misusing his classroom as a forum. The homosexuals defeated the proposition thanks to the influence of Harvey Milk, the first sodomite elected official. In addition to campaigning at live events, Milk was all over television. His end goal wasn't just political, it was to ensure that as many sodomites were out and proud as possible. 1978, uh, in California, there was a proposition called Proposition 6. This law that was going to try and be passed was in order to stop or ban gays and lesbians from working in California's public schools. But in order to combat that, a guy named Harvey Milk, a disgusting, filthy faggot, who was an American politician and openly gay, he basically uh, championed a, a movement and told all the fags to come out of the closet to all their family members to try and persuade all of their family members to vote against Proposition 6. And you know what? It worked. What I'm going to do is call upon the gay community to come out now, keep the education going, keep talking one-to-one, -to -one, talk to your relatives, your friends, your family, so that you can find out about gay people and shatter the myths once and for all so we can live in harmony. Gay people all across the state, the Briggs can only be defeated if each and every one of you comes out to everyone you know, you must. We are coming out of the closet. When are you going to come out of yours? We see all kinds of walls being broken down. We see them affecting our culture. And you know what? At this point, they've infected every area of our culture. The news media. Let me tell you about some fags on the news media today. Anderson Cooper. Richard Maddow. I'm sorry, Rachel. Shepard Smith, Don Lemon, Robin Roberts, Sam Champion, Thomas Roberts. I mean, you watch the mainstream media, it's all facts. And you wonder why they lie. It's because that's all they can do is lie. Anderson Cooper came out in a letter online. In a note to the Daily Beast, Andrew Sullivan, the journalist said, the fact is, I'm gay. Always have been, always will be. Cooper went on to say, I couldn't be any more happy, comfortable with myself, and proud. Roger Ailes died today. The founder of our network, our former CEO and chairman. When details of my personal life became public, he supported me. 
my partner Gio and I went to a 4th of July party at his amazingly beautiful home overlooking West Point. We have been talking a lot tonight about people coming out. Do people really need to do it anymore? The answer is yes. To millions, Good Morning America anchor Robin Roberts is an inspiration in so many ways. And on Saturday night at the Fountain Blue on Miami Beach, her leadership and courage were honored by the National LGBTQ Task Force. Being gay and from the South, you just don't think these moments are going are going to happen. If people like Phil Robertson are deserving of keeping their platforms and are even um, defended and celebrated, then people like Don Lemon or Thomas Roberts or Rachel Maddow or Sam Champion or Anderson Cooper or Robin Roberts are also deserving of their platforms and should be celebrated as well. They want to infect your house. Hey, there's someone knocking at the door today. It's the news media. There's someone knocking at the door today saying, hey, uh, bring the man out to me. Bring your little boys out to me. Hey, it's Disney Channel. Hey, it's Nickelodeon. Disney and Nickelodeon have both positioned themselves as pro-fag propaganda outlets featuring commercials about queer pride. An article published by CBN News said the following, quote, Disney has made headlines for promoting LGBTQ elements in programming in the past few years, and Disney even brought an LGBTQ Pride event to Disneyland Paris for the first time in its history last year. During June, the Disney Channel itself aired a Pride ad featuring Raven Simone, who was lesbian. Raven Simone never says the word gay in the ad, focusing instead on coming together with all walks of life. The article continues, throughout the month, Nickelodeon was more explicit, featuring various homosexual and lesbian artists. The commercials on both networks were clearly designed for younger audiences. Hey, it's all these different, you know, television programs, it's the commercials, it's now Rich Crackers. Rich Crackers has a commercial out with two dudes saying, oh no, so normal, they're so loving. They're not normal, they're disgusting. They're reprobate, they're vile, they're wicked, they're sons of Beulah Day. Don't believe the lies today. Unfortunately, liberals are trying to turn this country into woketopia and are flooding the airwaves with a bunch of woke Christmas commercials this year, like this one from Etsy. But the Ritz Cracker Company decided that they had to one-up Etsy, so their commercial depicts a man bringing his black, gay, gender, non-binary boyfriend over for Christmas. Join us in helping create a more welcoming world at tasteofwelcome.com. I got a book here, it's called Hollywood Propaganda. It's a book written by a guy named, guy named Mark Dice. Here's the thing, he's definitely not an independent fundamental Baptist. Like, no one would argue that he's an independent fundamental Baptist. He's not King James only. Do you know what? He's right on this doctrine. In 1989, two gay activists published a book titled After the Ball, How America Will Conquer Its Fear and Hatred of Gays in the 90s, which detailed their goals to have Hollywood produce propaganda that portrayed gays as victims of circumstance and oppression, not as aggressive challengers. Their idea was that gays must be portrayed as victims in need of protection so that straights will be inclined by reflex to assume the role of protector. Their plan worked perfectly as Joe Biden admitted when giving a speech for Jewish American Heritage Month, when he said it wasn't anything we legislatively did, it was will and grace. It was the social media, literally. That's what changed people's attitudes. That's why I was so certain that the vast majority of people would embrace and rapidly embrace gay marriage. And beyond all that, I bet you 85% of those changes, whether it's on Hollywood or social media, are a consequence of Jewish leaders and the industry the influence is immense. The influence is immense. That was quotes from Joe Biden. Vice President Biden has credited will and grace with changing America's attitudes about same-sex marriage. I think will and grace probably did more to educate the American public than almost anything anybody's ever done so far. On this, supporters and opponents of same-sex marriage agree. Hollywood has been incredibly influential in encouraging acceptance of gays and lesbians. It was through the medium of television that millions of Americans first had open gays and lesbians in their living rooms. In this country, we went from overwhelming majorities who were against same-sex marriage to overwhelming majorities supporting same-sex marriage within the span of a couple of years. What changed people's minds was will and grace was Modern Family. 
was watching people who were gay on television being, you know, normal. I think Cameron and Mitchell definitely have resonated with a lot of people, uh, but also resonated with a lot of people who maybe aren't uh, terribly keen on the idea of, of two men getting married or having a baby. And I think that they look at Cameron and Mitchell and they enjoy them very much. And they sort of question, well, if it's okay for Cameron and Mitchell, why is it not okay for you know Bob and Joe down the street? And it sort of changes their mind. And I think we are, we're opening up a lot of people's minds with it. So I think it's very important. Hollywood has done a great deal of work causing acceptance in American culture for homosexuality. Oh, they're so kind. Oh, they're so normal. No, they're not. Oh, they want to adopt children. I know why. In November 2011, a sodomite couple in Connecticut were arrested for assaulting two of their nine adopted sons. The abuse went on for years before charges were filed. In December 2013, sodomites living in California were found guilty of abusing a boy they had adopted. It evidently wasn't enough for the perverts to engage in the depravity themselves. They even offered the child to other men for further abuse in Australia, the United States, France, and Germany. In March 2018, female sodomites from Woodland, Washington put their six adopted children in a vehicle and drove it off a cliff in an apparent murder-suicide on the California coastline. Neighbors of the reprobates told a local news station that they suspected the children had been starved and a case on the family was opened prior to the murder-suicide alleging that the children were neglected and abused. In August 2020, a local news affiliate in Oklahoma City revealed that police arrested a sodomite couple who had been repeatedly assaulting a child they adopted over the course of multiple years. The men involved reportedly engaged in 19 counts of indecent or lewd acts with a child under 16, among other disturbing crimes. What is the deception? What is their goal? What is their agenda today? The goal of these sodomites and these sons of Belial is to try and make it seem like they're normal, but there's nothing normal about them. This morning, cartoon controversy after Alabama Public Television refused to air the premiere episode of the hit children's series, Arthur, which depicted a same-sex wedding of one of its most popular characters. Now, in California, in 2011, they passed a law that said that every public school institution must teach LGBT history as part of their sexual education. Now California public school curriculum will include lessons in second grade about diverse families. In fourth grade, students will learn about California's place in the gay rights movement. In the classroom, students will learn about prominent LGBT historical figures throughout the world. The sodomites aren't satisfied with transforming the entertainment industry. They also want to indoctrinate children at school with the deception that homosexuality is normal. They're achieving this through America's public school system, where students are learning about homosexuality for the express purpose of normalization. So you have to literally put your kids and they have to learn about it. But you know what they're always gonna forget? Genesis 19. I'm okay with, you know, you know, education of their history. Four states currently require LGBT education to be taught in public schools. California was the first to mandate the lessons in 2011, followed by Colorado, New Jersey, and Illinois in 2019. Come next school year, students will get a history lesson on the evolution, the struggles, and the contributions of the gay, lesbian, and transgender community. Many hoping the history lesson will lead to more tolerance, acceptance, and less bullying of students who identify with the LGBTQ community. And the Bible tells us, it says in 2 Peter chapter 2, look at verse 6. And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those that after should live ungodly, and delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked, for that righteous man dwelling among them, and seeing and hearing, vexed his righteous soul from day to day, with their unlawful deeds. Now that's some LGBT history that I'm okay teaching our children. And he said, look, it is. We are supposed to teach our kids history. Here's the history. They're always predators. They're always wicked. They're always vile. They're always reprobate. That's the LGBT. And look, we ought not think that we're special. Pompeii, 
just like a modern day Sodom and Gomorrah. And guess what? It was burnt to a crisp. America has changed significantly thanks in large part to cultural influencers who've deceived people into believing that sodomy is natural and normal. The sharp moral decline of the United States culminated in the 2015 Supreme Court ruling that made fag marriage legal, which was ultimately a catalyst for even more perversion and the innocence of children being defiled at public libraries across the country. All gays wanted was to be able to get married, they said. But within just a few short years after the Supreme Court ruling made it legal nationwide in 2015, we saw the proliferation of dozens of different genders, pre-teen child drag queens, and drag queen story hour events popping up at public libraries across the country. In numerous cases, the drag queens who are reading books to children at the events have been found to be convicted pedophiles. What a surprise. An LGBT website called Pink News ran a headline titled, Republican lawmakers want to make child drag shows illegal, expressing their anger that a US representative proposed a bill that would prohibit anyone under the age of 18 from participating in drag shows. Drag Queen Story Hour is uh, fantastic because uh, it addresses all of these issues of gender fluidity and self-acceptance. Drag Queen Story Hour is advertised as an event that captures the imagination and play of childhood and gives kids glamorous, positive, and diverse role models. And these people are dressed like the biggest freak shows you've ever seen in your life. And why do they do it? Because they want to have some kind of effect on your children that they can carry in to their later life. Look, we don't want these people, we don't want our kids seeing garbage like that. These gay pride parades where they're you know, walking around and they're, they're all half naked or naked. And then people take their kids to it. So they have to see that filth. That is, it, it burns an image in their mind that that kid will never forget. You know, and, and on one of the Drag Queen Story Hour things that I happen to see, which I w wish I could unsee, you can't unsee it though. One of the things that I, that I saw was they were going, who wants to be a drag queen? And all the kids in the crowd were going, I do. That's what they're, that's a recruitment. And that's how they create new sodomites as they recruit them. Your little five-year-old, your little six-year-old, your little Johnny, second grade. They're trying to experiment with these children. They're trying to get the most disgusting, filthy, fag-looking, transvestite, drag queen, abominable freak, and bring them into a library with children and read books to them. They don't care about reading books to children. It's not just television and the education system attempting to brainwash the masses and push homosexuality. Leftist political action groups are also propagating it. One of them is Black Lives Matter, a group funded by a globalist power broker, George Soros. Two of the three Black Lives Matter co-founders are open sodomites. The organization clearly states that it promotes homosexuality in opposition of the nuclear family unit. There was no pride parade this June due to the pandemic, but this parade has more participants than any pride parade and with a mixed message by design. We have an intersection here of Black Lives Matter and Pride. There are obviously there are gay people out there who are black and as a gay person myself, I'm here to support. Diverse, young, inclusive, united by shared concerns, equality for all, those who wave this flag and those who wave this one. Who is the news media trying to push for today is their new champion, is their new leader, Black Lives Matter. Yet you go to their website, just right on the front basically, it says we disrupt the Western prescribed nuclear family structure requirement by supporting each other as extended families and villages that collectively care for one another, especially our children to the degree that mothers, parents, and children are comfortable. So they say, we don't want to have a normal family. We don't want a mom, a dad, and children. We want to disrupt that. You already did it. You know what they're trying to do? Keep the problem going. They're not trying to fix anything. They say, we foster a queer affirming network because Black Lives Matter has nothing to do with your skin color and has everything to do with sin, filth, and smut says, we, when we gather, we do so with the intention of freeing ourselves from the tight grip of heteronormative thinking, or rather the belief that all in the world are heterosexual unless they disclose otherwise. That's the reality. 
Hey, they're going up and down the streets. They're violent. They're protesting. They're trying to destroy a man and a woman, getting married, having children, the normal family. They're trying to replace it with the modern family. You know what? It's not modern. It's perverted. It's disgusting. It's filthy. You know, it's from hell. These sons of Belial today, they're not normal. They're not loving. The infestation of perversion in the education system, entertainment industry, and practically every inch of Western culture has been unrelenting and clearly aimed at normalizing sodomy. The goal is simple, desensitize and brainwash the masses into believing that sodomites are exactly like everyone else. This is the deception. Hey, they love to say they claim they believe in science and truth, but they reject science, they reject truth, because these people, according to science, they're disgusting pedophiles, they're predators. In reality, they're predators. That's the science, that's the reality today. Don't believe the lie, oh, they're so normal, they're so loving, they don't even love themselves. Do you think that the, there is a connection between homosexual activities and pedophilic activities? Oh, absolutely. Uh, think back 300 years before Christ, Aristophanes noted that those in, with homosexual inclinations naturally gravitated to boys. Uh, they were very reluctant to get in uh, uh, marriage and family rearing situations. Uh, the church fathers noted the same thing, uh, talking about the, the corruption of boys. If you look at what the homosexual researchers themselves have said, oh, absolutely. Dr. Paul Cameron is the chairman of the Family Research Institute and has done extensive work to expose the link between sodomy and pedophilia. He goes on to cite a research project by Alfred Kinsey, a faggot himself, who asked over 2,000 sodomite perverts about the youngest individual they've ever been physical with. 27% of the respondents admitted to abusing boys 15 years of age or younger. Dr. Cameron also noted that 5% of the respondents admitted to abusing boys 8 or 9 years old and younger. Got another story here about a protocol officer for a general at the U.S. Central Command at McDill Air Force Base, Tampa, Florida, has been arrested for allegedly trying to entice a 17-year-old boy into sexual activity. So here's a Jerry Sandusky, a Jerry Sandusky type. He's a protocol officer for a general at U.S. Central Command. I mean, near the top of the food chain here. And so expect to see a lot more of this. Remember, we've talked about the fact that homosexuals commit crimes against children, sex crimes against children, at about 10 times the rate of the heterosexual population. There's this proclivity toward the abuse of children. You know, one of the things that we get criticized for saying is that homos are pedophiles. Now, this should be obvious to any rational person because it doesn't matter what angle we look at this from, Homos are pedophiles, okay? So let's take it from a few angles. Let's look at the historical angle. Let's go back and look at all the ancient Greek literature that deals with homos, and it's all centered around pedophilia. Well, you know, you talk about ancient Sparta, and you could talk about Plato and his writings and things. Look, it doesn't matter what you look at. Homosexuality has always had pedophilia as part and parcel of that lifestyle historically so we could start with ancient greek literature and take that all the way until now and we got the north american man boy love association and we can look at the different gay rights movements in the 70s and in the 80s and look at what they said their stated goals were and you know one of their biggest goals is always lower the age of consent uh, so if we look at the history it points to the fact they're pedophiles. Yeah. Then we could look at it statistically. Yeah, right. Open homos account for 40% of pedophiles, yeah. even though they're only 2% of the population. Yeah. The math's not adding up, folks. Yeah. 
2% of the population that are open sodomites are 40% of the pedophiles. That means that a homo is 20 times more likely to be a pedophile. The archives of sexual behavior also confirmed a stark imbalance between homosexual and heterosexual child molestation. It found that sodomites were vastly overrepresented, with 25% of the offenders being homosexual pedophiles. You know, there's a report that was done in 1987. It's called Self-Reported Sex Crimes of Non-Incarcerated Paraphiliacs. You say, what's a paraphiliac? It's a pervert, okay, it's a sodomite, all right? They like to hurt family members and non-family members. Whenever they're hurting family members, if the, if the target was a female, the number of times they hurt this child, okay, when it's a female is 81 times. When it's a male, it's 62 times. So when it's in the family, apparently the females, they get it a little bit worse. But when it's a non-family member, so when any of these predators targets a child that's a non-family member and they get a female, it, they hurt them 23 times. But when it's a male, so this is like just straight sodomite, pedophilia, they hurt the children 281 times. Now, how many kids are they hurting, okay? Well, whenever it's a female victim, these pedophiles hurt 19.8 females on average. That's unimaginable. But you know when it's boys? The statistic's mind-blowing. Their average number of victims is 150. 150 victims. These people are, like the Bible says, implacable. How many is enough for you? How many is enough for you? Oh, they're so, they're so loving and kind and fun. Look, this isn't the Bible. This is just secular sources saying, look at what these people are doing, what these people are like. Many homosexuals, I don't know the exact number, so I'm, I'm not going to hazard a guess. It'll be in my column. I'm doing the research on it. But have more than 50 to 100 partners. It's not uncommon at all for homosexuals to have 50 to 100 partners. So promiscuity, anonymous promiscuity, is rampant in the homosexual community, and as well as sexual abuse. A 1982 study by the Atlanta Centers for Disease Control showed that homosexual men infected with the AIDS virus had committed sodomy with an average of 1,000 different partners. Sodomites are 171 times more likely to contract AIDS than normal people, and anywhere from 3 to 14 times more likely to get all kinds of STDs. Okay, then let's look, to the, let, let's look at it scripturally. Okay, scripturally, they're pedophiles because number one, they're full of all unrighteousness. They'll do anything. They're capable of anything. Number two, we see that the sodomites in Sodom and Gomorrah young and old from every quarter came to assault the two angels that came into Lot, which shows right there that if they're gonna bring children to something like that, if a bunch of sodomite dudes are gonna bring children, because it mentions young people, it shows that they're already inducting the young people into that lifestyle, which shows they're pedophiles. The idea that sodomites are predators can be substantiated from scripture. Two similar stories, Genesis 19 and Judges 19, depict them as violent animals looking to assert themselves to violate the innocent. In Genesis 19, Lot caught the attention of the homosexual predators at Sodom when he invited two angels who were sent to rescue Lot from Sodom's impending destruction to stay with them for the evening. The men of the city eventually compass the house and attack. They called unto Lot and said unto him, where are the men which came into thee this night? Bring them out unto us that we may know them. And when they say there that we may know them, they're not just saying, you know, we just want to meet these guys. We just want to shake their hand and get to know them. You know, this is the word that the Bible often uses all the way back to Genesis chapter number four, when it talks about, you know, Adam knew his wife Eve and she conceived and brought forth a son. You know, the result of Adam knowing his wife was that she became pregnant. Okay, so the Bible uses the word know to talk about, you know, it's a euphemism for obviously something else. Okay, Lot comes out and says, look, guys, don't do this wicked, awful thing. These guys are staying with me. Whatever you do, don't do it. 
and he even tries to get them to uh, su suffice him themselves with his daughters, which obviously is a bizarre thing to offer them. What did Genesis 19 have to say? Well, look at verse number four. But before they lay down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, compassed the house round, both old and young, all the people from every quarter. Look, these disgusting predators, they harm everyone and turn them just like them. The Bible says it was everybody in Sodom. You know how that gets that way? You let these predators loose to hurt all these children. You see, in Genesis 19, you have a city that is filled with these homos, with these sodomites. And these men in the city, instead of contenting themselves to just be a homo or get married to each other or whatever they want to do, what do they want to do? They want to go after the two guys who just got into the town. The two innocent visitors who march into town and they say, we want those two guys, the whole town's there. They say, we want to bring those two guys out and we want to know them. The Bible already told us they're all pedophiles. There wasn't a young child that they didn't hurt in Sodom. The cries of all the children constantly going into the ears of God. It made God so angry that he rained down fire and brimstone on all these perverters of the flesh. He hated these people. He despised them. They're worthy of death. And man wasn't taking care of it. So God says, you know what? I'll take care of it. And then look what they say in verse 9. They said, stand back. And they said again, this one fellow came in to sojourn. Talking about how Lot has just been temporarily living there. This one fellow came into sojourn, and he will needs be a judge. Now will we deal worse with thee than with them? And they pressed sore upon the man, even Lot, and came near to break the door. So, because they don't get access to these two men, who are actually angels, but they just look like normal men, instead they decide that they're going to violate Lot. And so they attack Lot, and they, they, they you know, are trying to assault him, and they even put half them up against the door and they're almost going to break the door and then the two men you know put forth their hand reach in grab and pull them inside the house and so on and so forth then they reveal their identity to Lot and tell them how God has sent them there to get Lot out of the city because the city's going to be destroyed with fire and brimstone because of all the sin and wickedness and so on look at verse 7 he says this even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal hellfire. So where are the people who died and got blown out and put into hell? Well, well the sodomites, where, where are they today? They're in hell, right? They're reserved there. So you, you know what this tells me? Sodomites, homosexual lives don't matter. That's right. Yeah. That's what it tells me. They've now, that, I'm not going to take it upon myself to go do anything. That's the government's job, and they're sure not going to do it. So we just have to wait for, you know, when Jesus comes back. The cry of Sodom came up to the Lord. Who's crying? He's not listening to a bunch of Sodomites because his ear is closed under their prayers, the Bible says. But he hears the victims. He's hearing the children. He's hearing the, the, the young babes and children that are being abused there. Scripturally, we see that they are always portrayed as a predator in all three instances, whether it be Genesis 9, Genesis 19, or Judges 19, they're always forcing someone. In Judges 19, we see another instance in which sodomites try to break into a home to commit a vile act. Like in Genesis 19, they're depicted in scripture as completely devoid of a conscience. When a certain Levite, his servant, and his concubine were invited to lodge for an evening in Gibeah, sons of Belial surrounded the home and demanded to know the Levite physically. Verse 22. Now as they were, as they were making their hearts merry, behold, the men of the city, and I want you to notice this, certain sons of Belial. Now you say, who's Belial in the Bible? Is he like part of the lineage of Adam or, you know, who's, whose tribe is he a part of? Belial is the devil. Certain sons of Belial beset the house round about and beat at the door and spake to the master of the house, the old man saying, bring forth the man that came into thine house that we may know him. This is evil. This is wicked. What, are, what do we know this as today? Faggotry. Homosexuality. 
sodomy. Verse 24, Behold, here is my daughter, a maiden, and his concubine. Them I will bring out now, and humble ye them, and do with them what seemeth good unto you. But unto this man do not so vile a thing. Now, this is not right. Lot was trying to offer the same thing. But what this shows you is how fierce these people are. That, that both of these men are thinking, I am not going to be able to, to just make them go away unsatisfied completely. Verse 25, but the men would not hearken to him. They're not listening. They're like, no, that's not what we want. So, so the man took his concubine and brought her forth unto them. So they didn't want it, but he's just like, here. It says, and they knew her and abused her all the night until the morning. And when the day began to spring, they let her go. They raped this woman. These are fags. Does everyone see that? These are fags. So they were placated with just taking the woman herself. This shows you that the whole, well, if he's gay, he's born that way, and he only likes guys. No, 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 no. He's a dog who will go both ways. The Bible proves it right here. Learning about who the sodomites really are might lead one to ask the question, how did they get this way? The world says that they were born that way, that their behavior can be explained away as an orientation they were genetically assigned with. But the Word of God says something completely different. It says in Romans 1 that they rejected God to the point of reprobation, meaning they're beyond hope of spiritual salvation, and in doing so are now capable of committing sin that falls outside the scope of regular sin nature. In other words, homosexuality is a symptom or the result of an individual becoming a reprobate. What does the Bible say? Let's look what the Bible says, because the Bible explains us in Romans 1 how they got that way. It says in verse 21, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore, meaning for this reason, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator, who is blessed forever, amen. For this cause, see there is a cause, isn't there? There is a reason. For this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. So the Bible clearly talks about here, men with men doing that which is unseemly, doing that which is vile, doing that which is against nature. How did they get that way? Well, the Bible tells us three times. And God often repeats things twice, three times, when he wants to get it through our heads, when he wants to emphasize it to us. That's why he said, God gave them up, God gave them up, God gave them over. Okay, but why did God, three times it says, why did God give them over to vile affections, give them over to the uncleanness of their own lust? Why? Because the Bible says that they didn't even want to retain God in their knowledge. The Bible said that when they knew God, meaning that they were exposed to who God was, they did not glorify Him as God. They were not thankful. They became vain in their own imagination. They refused to worship the Creator. And the Bible tells us that even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, they, did, they hated God so much, they didn't even want to think about God or even remember that He existed in the same way God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, meaning they don't come naturally. And then just a few verses later, he says that these people in verse 30 are haters of God. So according to Romans chapter one, the way that they got that way was by rejecting the Lord.
They hate God. They reject God. And God says, you know what? I'm going to punish you for that because he's a just God, because he's a holy God, because he's a wrathful God. You know, God is love, but at the same time, he's just. He's full of judgment. And at the same time, he's holy. He can't tolerate that type of wickedness. And once someone's damned themselves, he says, all right, well, I'm going to give you a bunch of wrath on this earth. So not only are you going to go to hell, you're going to have hell on earth. You're going to be a sodomite. You're going to be a reprobate. What is reprobate? Rejected. God gave them up. God gave them over to what? To a reprobate mind. That word reprobate means rejected to do those things which are not convenient. Here, here's what Jesus is saying. There is a, a reprobate problem in the United States of America today. And you say, well, what's the problem? What's the problem? It, it, it's not a homosexual problem. That's just the fruit. That's not the root. That, 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 that's just a symptom. That's not the sickness. You say, what, what's the problem? The problem is this, that we have a society who knew God and glorified him not as God. And here's all I'm telling you, when you reject God and you reject God and you reject God, eventually he might reject you. It's that simple. Men who burn in lust with other men, even the women who burn in lust one toward another against nature. The Bible teaches that they got that way by rejecting the Lord, by hating the Lord. Look at verse 29, this is how the Bible describes these people. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God. Look at verse 31, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable and merciful. Verse 32, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. So the sodomites not only do everything on this list, but they're pleased when other people do the same things on that list. So it's saying sodomites have pleasure in other sodomites. Not only that, sodomites enjoy murderers. Sodomites enjoy fornicators. Sodomites enjoy despisers of those that are good, the haters of God. Anything that's on this list that someone's doing, sodomites like it. Being filled with, you, notice this word, all. Now for those of you that need it, I didn't go to Bible college, but for those of you that need it, if you go back to the Greek, you know what that word all means? It means all. That, that might help the Calvinists too a little bit. Be, being filled with all. See, he, you say, well, what's the problem with the reprobate? Here's the problem with the reprobate. You say, well, somebody could be a fornicator. Somebody could be disobedient to children. Somebody, here's what the Bible tells us. They do this all. Haters of God, listen to me. They're all filled with hatred towards God. Oh no, well, I, I knew, a, I got a sodomite in my church. He loves God, he's just struggling with sin. No, he's a hater of God. Look, Christians are gonna have to decide, do we believe the Bible or not? But uh, this week, I want to talk about love is love, God's love for the LGBT community. And uh, I just think that because Jesus invented modern love as a matter of historical fact, the way that we see it today, I think it's going to be really cool to learn about how he teaches us to love the LGBT community. No matter what you identify as sexually, whether that would be lesbian, gay, bisexual, straight, or other, you're welcome and you're loved here. And no matter if you hate God or you're not sure about God or you are part of a different religion or you love Jesus from Scripture, I want you to know you are loved and welcomed here. As we engage with the LGBT community, we have to first and foremost not see them as our enemies. Jesus loves people. That's the theme of this whole series. He loves gay people, straight people. And if you've been hurt by Christians, I just as some kind of you know representative Christian, you might look at me because I'm a pastor. I want to say I'm sorry, and I would love to hear your story. 
Second thing I want to say uh, to those of you in the homosexual community is be clear on this. You matter to God. God cares for you. God loves you. God made you. I need to say this really clearly because words matter. <laughs> At Eastlake, lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people, brothers and sisters, you are officially encouraged and supported to be involved in the life and work of this church at all levels. Despite the myriad of statistics and evidence from a biblical standpoint, even those who claim the name of Christ are embracing the sodomite community. The rise of a left-wing brand of fake Christianity has seen an unprecedented shift in the churches of America. A shift away from biblical principles toward whatever the world embraces. One by one, preachers express how much they love the sodomites, compromising on the word of God in the process. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worship, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now, 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2 is a very important chapter of the Bible talking about the coming Antichrist, coming about the one that's going to present himself and declare himself that he is God. And the Bible says that this is going to happen before the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. So before the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible teaches two things must happen. The first is that there's a great falling away. The second is that the man of sin will be revealed. This phrase falling away first is something that a lot of people, you know, have had different ideas, different ways to interpret. What does that exactly mean? But the Bible's pretty clear that the falling away is just from truth. People of faith haven't always been uh, welcoming to the LGBT community. And in fact, uh, many times people of faith have been outright uh, contemptuous of LGBT people. And one of the things I'm trying to do, at least in the Catholic Church, is to remind people that, you know, at least for Christians, uh, Jesus' message was always one of inclusion and welcome. We have uh, probably hundreds of thousands of LGBT Catholics uh, who are participating in the lives of their parishes, and they're, they're Catholic already, they're baptized already, and they have every right to be uh, in the church as much as the Pope or their local bishop or me. Pope Francis continues to shake things up in the Catholic Church. Yesterday, apparently, he was talking to a gay man in Chile and told him, that you are gay doesn't matter. God made you like this and loves you like this. So will Catholics follow his who am I to judge stance? I love this so much. This is the difference between tolerance and acceptance, which are very different. Mm -hmm. This is not, I'm not gonna judge you. This is God loves you. Now let me give you some quotes from John Chrysostom about how he felt about this sin. Now who's John Chrysostom? Well, he was born in 347 AD and died in 407 AD. So he's one of those church fathers, okay, a long time ago. This guy has been venerated by the Catholic Church, the Eastern Orthodox Church, the Oriental Orthodoxy, the Assyrian Church of the East, the Ancient Church of the East, the Anglican community, and Lutherans. I mean, this guy is loved of these churches. Venerated, he's a saint, he's honored. You know what? I don't believe for even a second if he came to preach for them they could tolerate it for genuine pleasure is that which is according to nature but when god hath left one then all things are turned upside down and thus not only was their doctrine satanical but their life too was diabolical so according to john chrysostom he says that fags those mentioned in romans chapter one they're satanic and they're diabolical okay this is what he also says talking about their, what they do. This is contrary both to law and nature. For even if there were no hell and no punishment had been threatened, this were worse than any punishment. John Chrysostom is saying he would rather be threatened with hell than being a faggot. He's saying, don't threaten me with that because that's way worse. He also said this, and name what sin you will, None will you mention equal to this lawlessness. And if they that suffer such things perceive them, they would accept 10,000 deaths so they might not suffer this evil. He said, you would rather die 10,000 times than be a fag. He says, for there is not 
There surely is not a more grievous evil than this insolent dealing. He says, there's nothing worse. He says, what shall we say of this madness, which is so much worse than fornication, as cannot even be expressed? For I should not only say that thou hast become a woman, but that thou hast lost thy manhood, and hast neither changed into that nature nor kept that which thou hadst, but thou hast been a traitor to both of them at once and deserving both of men and women to be driven out and stoned. So he says, you know what? You gave up your man card and became a woman. And he says, you know what? No, you are a traitor to both. You're just, you just need to be driven out and notice stone. Go to Leviticus 20, 13 for a moment. The Bible says in Leviticus chapter 20, verse 13, if a man also lie with mankind as he lieth with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. Let me tell you what this J.D. Greer false prophet said. He said truth without grace is fundamentalism. He has a sodomite on his staff that's a close friend coming over to his house and being close friends with his kids. He says, well, we need to be more like Jesus when we preach about the LGBT community. Jesus representing our churches would be known as the friends of the LGBT community. Uh, here is number one. Jesus representing churches will be known as the friends of the LGBTQ community. This is the president of the Southern Baptist Convention. They have 50,000 churches in America. They're the biggest denomination, the largest group. And the tip of their spear is saying, we need to be friends with these wicked, vile, disgusting reprobates. Horrifying. Hey, you need to bring them in your house. Let them love on your kids. He says, are you drawing the gay and lesbian community close? I think the question to us as church leaders, have you drawn the gay and lesbian community close? I hope not. Would to God they'd hear the message already. Are you, are you their friends? Are you their friends? No. Do gay and lesbian people feel welcome in your home? Would gay and lesbian people feel welcome in your home? Hell no, never. Not for a second. And also not in the house of God, never. Well, Doug and Kaylee, uh, members here, 61% of them here at Wilshire Baptist Church voted to allow those LGBT members to do things like get married, baptized, and become church leaders. Pastor Mark Wingfield at Wilshire Baptist Church says he recognizes nearly 40% of his congregation isn't happy about allowing LGBT members to fully participate. He says it wasn't one member or incident that sparked the exhaustive research and vote. It was the changing times. And congregations that think they're not going to deal with it are living in a bubble that's going to burst. I want to open my arms to as many people as possible and say, you're welcome here. How about this church, Wilshire Baptist Church? It's on Abrams Road in Dallas, Texas. Now in 2016, this church will grant full membership to LGBT individuals. The congregation decided in a vote that in turn severs ties with the Baptist General Convention of Texas. It says that 61% favorably voted. Since 2016, they've been, you know, flooded with all these trans freaks and all these gay faggots. I bet they wouldn't let me come preach this sermon in the morning. Good night. You know what? They're never welcome in the house of God. And that place is a house of iniquity. It's a place for Belial. It's not a place for God. That's disgusting. These queer bait Baptists, they're literally trying to attract queers into their church. And then they're getting up and saying, we're so great because we let these trans freaks into our church. You're not great. You're like those Benjamites, and God's gonna destroy you. We're never gonna be a queer bait Baptist church, never. They're not welcome to even put their foot near my parking lot. Get out. We'll throw you out on the street, right in the middle of traffic, because that's where you belong. Go to hell, you freaks. These Christians today, they've gone insane. They don't believe the Bible. They have no common sense. They reject the death penalty. They reject punishment for these people. Well, we're all sinners. So let's bring the pedophiles in. Let's bring the sodomites in. Let's bring the most vile, reprehensible people on the planet into the churches. When the Bible is constantly warning you to root these people out. The Bible's telling you, get them out. These other Christians are trying to bring them in. 
Why? Because they're deceived today, thinking that they're normal. And people act like, oh, well, you're not loving and you're not caring. And I know we talked about this already, but let's just, you know, talk about it a little more. In, in Leviticus 19, you got the famous verse 18, thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And I know we talked about that last week, but let me just reemphasize the idea that the famous thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself is a verse out of Leviticus right in between the two chapters that condemn homosexuality. And today you got Christians going around talking about, in fact, they throw it in our face. When we get up and we preach against the sodomites, they, they throw it in our face. Well, aren't you supposed to love thy neighbor as thyself? And they're so, you know, stupid and so novice and don't understand scripture, they don't even realize that that verse comes out of Leviticus. And they're like, you shouldn't preach Leviticus that sodomites be put to death. You should love your neighbor. Both of those are found in Leviticus. Jesus was quoting Leviticus. So you know what? We're going to love our neighbor as ourselves, and we're also going to teach that they deserve the death penalty. It isn't just large liberal denominations that are trying to extend an olive branch to sodomites. Even some so-called independent conservative Baptist churches have flip-flopped on the issue. In America, we need to stop burning flags and start burning fags. It's about time somebody said what needs to be said. It's vile, it's reprobate, and aid is a curse sent from God. It's a curse sent from God. You say, well, you shouldn't say that. Well, don't you say it. I will. It's my turn. That put them back in the closet. I'm going to tell you something. Those of you that are yelling and screaming and shouting, the reason they came out of the closet because there weren't enough men on the other side of the closet to keep them in. This is Jeff Owens. If you're responding to a sermon that I preached about gays, I would like to render the following apology. Nearly 15 years ago, I preached a sermon that promoted physically hurting gay people. I was young, stupid, and very immature. I didn't even hold to the belief of hurting people when I wrongfully made those comments. I regret those words and have asked God to forgive me for them over and over again. I'm not a believer in the gay lifestyle, but I was profoundly wrong in making any comments about hurting people. If I could retract the words, I certainly would. I no longer preach like that, and I purposely teach and train others to preach and behave properly as well. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. Somebody said all sin is sin. They don't kill you for all sin. Every sin in the Bible doesn't carry the death penalty. Every sin in the Bible is not rated the same. But the sin of homosexuality, of, of sodomy, however you want to classify it, in the word of God, it is an abomination, a sin worthy unto death. I've always said about homosexuals, you're welcome at Temple Baptist Church. You're welcome. Amen. We'll roll out the red carpet for you. This lifestyle is a part of the culture we live in. There's no place for a crude or vile attitude toward those living in this sin. No place. There, there's no place for it in a pulpit. There's no place for it in the pew. There's no place for us to degrade a lifestyle. Every person on this planet, regardless of their sexual orientation, deserves respect and dignity. And it has this guy, John Getch, okay, independent fundamental Baptist, and here's what he said. He said, every person on this earth deserves respect and dignity regardless of their sexual orientation. This is in a Baptist church in the house of God. How could someone just not be afraid that God is not just gonna strike them with a thunderbolt? How can anyone be that bold? I mean, do you not even believe God exists, John Getch? How in the hell can you stand up behind your pulpit as a man of God and not think God's gonna strike you dead to stand up and talk about people's sexual orientation? You faggot! You're wicked! How can you get behind the sacred desk, have some respect for the house of God, for God's word, for God's pulpit? This book doesn't talk about a sexual orientation. It talks about sodomites, filthy dogs, vile, brood, beasts, damnation and hell. That's what it talks about, you faggot. Well, how dare you call him a faggot? 
Well, you know what? Faggot, faggot, faggot. Because you know what? If he's not a faggot, then why is he so soft and interested in defending fags? He's a fag-loving idiot at best. He's a faggot at worst. One thing that surprises a lot of Christians is the idea of hating any singular person on this earth. You know, the Bible tells us that God so loved the world, and obviously God is love. But the Bible also teaches that God is just, and that God is holy, and that God is righteous. And so the Bible also tells us that there's some people that we should not love. The Bible says in 2 Chronicles chapter 19, verse 2, And Jehu the son of Hanani the seer went out to meet him, and said to King Jehoshaphat, Shouldest thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? Therefore is wrath upon thee from before the Lord. And so the Bible teaches that those that hate God, those that want to hurt God's people, they're oftentimes what the Bible calls reprobate, and they are people that should not be extended grace or love or mercy. They've already had their chance to accept the Lord's love and to accept his free gift of salvation. And because they've rejected it, God has rejected them. And so we should not love these people. If you truly love your grass, you're gonna hate the weeds. If you love your children, you're gonna hate those that would hurt your children, predators or pedophiles, anybody that would hurt them. And so the Bible makes it clear that we should not wish good or be loving or kind or compassionate to those whom God has already rejected, to those who hate God and wanna hurt God's people. In Psalms 139, the Bible says, for they speak against thee wickedly, and thine enemies take thy name in vain. Do not I hate them, O Lord, that hate thee, Am I not grieved with those that rise up against thee? I hate them with perfect hatred. I count them mine enemies. So we have in the book of Psalms a psalm where the author is making it clear that he hates people who hate the Lord and those who hate God. Even in fact, the New Testament tells us to sing the Psalms. And the Bible says, if any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be an anathema maranatha. And so it's actually a biblical concept to hate those who hate the Lord and those who would rise up against him. Those whom God has rejected the Bible says that we should not love them and help them, but rather we should have a biblical perspective towards them. In the book of Mark in chapter nine, the Bible reads in verse 42, and whosoever shall offend one of these little ones that believe in me, it is better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he were cast into the sea. So the Bible actually teaches that for some people, capital punishment would be better for them than allowing them to continue to harm more people, to harm more children. And obviously this would be true for the innocent victim, for the child, but it's also uh, beneficial for society. It's also beneficial for that perpetrator, that offender, in the sense that he won't restore up even more wrath from God to be used against him on judgment day. And so I believe what Jesus said here, that it's better for these people to be punished with the death penalty than to be allowed to continue to hurt and to harm children. And so it's important to realize that capital punishment is an important part of society. And we as Christians, we should believe the Bible and not care what this world has to say. One thing that's for certain is that those who are sodomites are evil, they're wicked, they're destroying our culture, they're destroying society. All they do is bring destruction to everything that they come in contact with. And we need to go back to the past where men of God used to preach against these filthy, disgusting freaks, against sodomites, against fags. We don't want the new way. We want the old path. We want to go back where it is the good way. And we want to preach the word of God with power. And we want to preach against this wickedness, against these vile affections where men have gone after each other. This is something that should be obviously preached against from every pulpit in America. And if men would just stand up and preach the word of God, we would change the culture. We would make a great impact because the word of God does not return void. But it goes out and has power and it's gonna make a huge difference in this world. Well, don't let Brother Howe's preaching upset you. God wouldn't have made us this way if he hadn't intended for us to love men to love men. Oh, you pagan, heathen, you, God didn't make you that way. Don't you blame God on your sins. Don't you blame God on your rejection of God's word. Not sickness, it's sin. Not illness, it's wickedness. It's not normal, it's pagan, it's iniquity. God hates it. 
God goes so far as to condemn the soul of every person who's a homosexual to everlasting torment. Check your Bible. The Bible takes a firm stand, and the Bible puts the death sentence on the homosexual. I said it's unscriptural. You can read this old holy Bible through from cover to cover, and you'll never find anything but condemnation for that kind of sin. Now, I warn you, dear friend, this is the only sin in the Bible that God says three times, I'll give you up, I'll give you up, I'll give you up. And this is the outstanding cause of a reprobate man. It's the most dangerous sin there is. And when they defied that law of their own moral constitution, God uses graphic language. He says that Israel's conquest of the land was but the feather in God's hand to tickle the throat of the land of Canaan that it might wretch and vomit out the inhabitants of the land. When people give themselves to homosexuality, the passage says the land becomes defiled, the nation becomes defiled, and mark it well, God will have a feather in his hand to tickle the throat of this nation until it vomits out the inhabitants of this land. Some people might ask, how do I find this preaching? I really like this preaching of the old where people were preaching against sodomites, preaching against these faggots. But you can actually still find that today. There's still men in this country that have not compromised on this issue, that are still willing to preach the truths of the Bible. They're still willing to preach Romans chapter number one, Leviticus chapter number 20, verse 13. And so you need to actually go out and search and find a church that's gonna stand up on the truths of the Bible and not be a compromiser. We need men to support those who are preaching the truths of the Bible, and we need to take a firm stand on the Word of God and not compromise today. Why didn't God send Abraham to Sodom and Gomorrah to try to preach them the gospel and tell them to be saved? You know, Abraham knew the reprobate doctrine. We saw that when he was talking with Melchizedek and the king of Sodom came over, he's like, can I get the people back? You can keep all the goods, right? And he's just like, I don't want nothing from you, even a shoe at you. Just get out of here and take your people. Melchizedek didn't rebuke him. Yeah. He's like, get out of here. <laughs> right? And when, what, what did Abraham tell God? He's like, surely thou wouldn't slay the righteous with the wicked. See, Abraham only, only deal was, he just figured, well, there's got to be somebody saved in Sodom and Gomorrah. I realize that the rest of them are wicked. Right? I, I mean, that's what he meant when he said that. I realize the rest of them are wicked, but you're going to kill the righteous? He's like, well, what if there's five? God's like, won't even do it for that. Go find them. Go find them. They're not there. Why? Because it was a nation of reprobates. Yeah, right. The Bible tells us in Psalm 78 verse 9 that the children of Ephraim, being armed and carrying bows, turn back in the day of battle. And what do we see today? We see pastors who are afraid to stand up for the truth, to afraid to call a fag a fag. Oh, you, that's not politically correct. Well, good, because I'm not a politician. I'm a preacher. Amen. The Bible over and over again proclaims this kind of negative message today. And today, preachers, they wanna just cherry pick certain positive verses or verses that really deal with the love of God, the mercy of God, the grace of God, which of course are all things we believe in, but they purposely avoid this type of a negative scripture and they never preach it. I like being able to preach the truth. And you know what, if we don't exercise the truth, if we don't preach what the Bible says, we'll lose it. Hey, if we don't preach that sodomites are filthy dogs, we'll lose that doctrine. 99% of Baptist preachers in America today don't have the guts to preach what needs to be preached. They don't have the guts to fight the real battle. They're all scared, they're all running away. And so you're left with the 300. What fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? It says, look, and what concord hath Christ with Belial? We already learned, look, the sodomites were the sons of Belial. How can I have any concord with them? How could I ever let them in my church if I love the Bible? Look, you either love the Bible and you have nothing to do with them or you hate God's word. That's your choice. There's not a, there's not a neutral opinion. It's time to rip 
some face. Yeah. It's time to call a faggot a faggot, a transvestite a disgusting dog. Yeah. Call it like it is. Gay bashing. Oh, like calling the beast? Like calling them reprobate? Like calling them filthy? Oh, you're gay bashing. I'm not afraid of that. You can't bash a faggot more to me. It's not possible. I like it. I like all of it. Why? Because we need to wake up today. I mean, these people are dedicated. These people are researching. They're finding out, you know, where we bank. They're finding out who we do business with. They're trying to get us shut down on all fronts. And you know what? Let me tell you something. I'm sick of it and I'm not gonna back down, and I'm sick of people not backing me up on this. And you know what? If you're not gonna back us up, then get out of here. We don't need your help. You know what? We have hundreds of people, hundreds of people here that will not compromise, and if you're not one of them, then get out. Amen. And I stand by the word of God because I'd be afraid not to preach the Bible. I'd be afraid to be ashamed of God's word. And a group of sodomites are not gonna stop me from preaching it. Yeah. You're gonna have to kill me. You're gonna have to destroy my life. And even then, the word of God will go forth and it'll ring even harder yeah. after that. Look at what it says. It says in verse 10, it says, Hear ye the word of the Lord, ye rulers of Sodom. Give ear unto the law of our God. Hey, if I preach Leviticus 20, 13 till the day I die, I'm still preaching the law of our God. Hey, you need to listen to the law of our God and quit listening to the television and your Hollywood movies and your video games where the sodomites are in the video games now. It says, give ear unto the, uh, the law of our God. Is the law of the Lord perfect or is it not? It's perfect. And what did he say? Put them to death. Every single individual instinctively knows that murder is wrong instinctively knows that bearing false witness is wrong, instinctively knows that sodomy is wrong. Yeah. Everyone knows that. Why? Because the law of God is written in their heart. They have that moral compass that tells them this is wrong. Yeah. Show me another reference to homosexuality, to sodomy, anywhere in the Bible, and tell me where it's anything to be accepted, tolerated, loved, exalted, given a pride day. I saw someone blaspheme Jesus Christ and say, well, if Jesus were here today, he would lead a pride parade. You pervert. You have no idea who Jesus Christ is. But guess what? You're going to meet him because he's coming back. And if you think he's going to be leading gay pride parades, yeah, he's going to be leading them straight into hell. No, but we're supposed to reach out to him. Why are we reaching out to someone that God gave up on? Why are we reaching out to someone that one God gave over? Why are we giving it? Look, if God Almighty, God says, there's nothing I can do for them. Why would you and I be trying to reach out? If you don't have some sort of anger or wrath or hatred towards people who want to violate the innocent, something's wrong with you. Something is wrong with your heart. Something's wrong with your mind. It's a natural thing. You say, I don't believe God hates. Have you heard of hell? <laughs> Who is there among all the tribes of Israel that came nada with the congregation unto the Lord? For they had made a great oath concerning him that came not up to the Lord to Mizpah, saying, He shall surely be put to death. Not only did the Benjamites who fought for these faggots, not only they were put to death, you know who else was put to death? All the other Baptists that wouldn't stand up and fight against them. All these queer bait Baptists. You're disgusting. You're running our country. I hate it. What does God think? You're worthy of death too. Why are all these Baptists standing up and saying these freaks should go back to hell? Go back to the closet. Put a bullet in your head. Why aren't they saying it? And you know what I think is so funny is when people attack us, Bible-believing creatures, and they say, ah, oh, why do you preach about homosexuality so much? Why do you keep bringing that up? Why are you so fixated on that? Why are you bringing it up? Hey, because it's being crammed out our throat every stupid day. Because not a day goes by that the TV and the magazines and the newspapers aren't cramming this trash down our throat. And you know what? We didn't pick this fight. The fight came to us. And you know what? I didn't write this book. And this book already predicted thousands of years ago that that's what would be happening. 
I mean, I didn't choose that, hey, in the end times, before the second coming of Christ, we're going to have to be ripping face about a bunch of perverts and homos, and that's going to be the big issue in America that everybody talks about every single day in America. Hey, I didn't choose that. I didn't even predict that. I thought my dad was wrong about that, okay? I didn't choose this fight. This fight has come to us, and you know what I say? Bring it on! Yeah. Some might ask, what's the response to this problem? Is it a physical battle? Is it something that we go out and we call to arms? The Bible says that this is a spiritual book and we actually wage a spiritual battle today. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but spiritual. And so it's important that we actually stand up behind God's pulpit and we preach the truths of God's word today. That's how we engage in battle. That's the correct response from a biblical perspective is not to go and wage a physical fight, but rather to preach the truth of God's word and to stir up men's hearts to actually believe the word of God today, to actually take a biblical stand for men to preach against the sodomites, to preach against the faggots, to preach against these perverters, these filthy dogs, these brute beasts, to stand up and proclaim the truth, to warn people against these predators, against these pedophiles, against those that would hurt their wives, hurt their children, and hurt society as a whole. You know, if America truly wants to be a godly nation, we have to rid ourselves of all these perverts, of all these people that hate the Word of God. And we need men to rally behind the preachers of God's Word. We need people to get into a good church where there's a leather-long, Bible-believing preacher that's not willing to compromise, but rather is going to stand firm on the truths of God's Word today. And so I encourage you to get into a godly church where they're going to preach against the sodomites and not fall victim to the deception. Because a guy is sensitive and, and, and he's an intellectual and he wears glasses, you make him out a queer. I never said a guy who wears glasses is a queer. A guy who wears glasses is a four eyes. A guy who is a fag is a queer. <laughs> now, I don't own a bakery, but I'm, I'm fitting to open one. I'm going to open a bakery. And I, you know, if they walk in, I'm not going to say, oh, I don't want to hurt their feelings. What does the Bible say, my friend? But you've been deceived tonight. You've been lied to. And you don't even know what the Bible says anymore. Because you're watching TV and you've been brainwashed. The media has been brainwashing you week after week and month after month and day after day to get you to think it's all about gay marriage, gay marriage. No! Care if they get married. That's not what the Bible says. Right. Oh no, I better be careful, this is a really hard decision. No, it's not a hard decision, Melissa. Look, do you, who thinks it's a hard decision if some faggot wants you to make him a wedding cake? Anybody struggling with that right now? You know, and the president of the Southern Bastard Convention, J.D. Greer, the wicked false prophet, he got up and said that we need to be friends to the LGBT community. We need to apologize to them. Here's my apology, go to hell! These filthy homos are not allowed at Verity Baptist Church ever. Amen. We're never bringing them in. Amen. We're never bringing these pedophiles in. We're not letting them be with our children. They're not welcome. And we're not backing up on that. If anything, we're getting stronger on it. Amen. We're making El Monte a righteous city. At First Works Baptist Church in El Monte, Pastor Bruce Mejia is preaching against people in the LGBTQ community. So how does God view them as rapists? How does God view them as child molesters? We're potentially targets to like hate crimes. But Pastor Mejia doesn't care what they think. I'm not afraid of these freaks. Thank you for watching our film on the sodomite deception. And the most important thing to know is that you're 100% sure if you died that you'd go to heaven. 
And the Bible actually makes it clear that you can know 100% sure that if you died, that you would go to heaven. And a lot of people think that going to heaven is based on how good a person you are, uh, if you go to church, if you turn from your sins, if you've been baptized, a lot of things that they do. But the Bible says that going to heaven has nothing to do with how you live your life, but rather where you're placing your faith. The Bible makes it clear because we've all sinned. In Romans chapter number 3, verse number 23, the Bible says, for all of sin it comes short of the glory of God, that we need a Savior. And the Bible makes it clear that a sin is if you break any of God's commandments. That would be lying, stealing, disobeying your parents. And because we've sinned, there's a punishment. The Bible says in Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. That means we're all going to physically die one day. And if I were to die, there's one of two places that my soul could go. It could go to heaven or it could go to hell. Now, the Bible tells us that hell is a place of fire. It's a place of torment. It never ends day nor night. And the Bible tells us that there's a lot of people that will go there. But ultimately, every single person deserves to go to hell for their sins. The Bible even says in Revelation 21, 8, And all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth the fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So the Bible makes it clear that even for telling one lie, you would deserve to go to the lake of fire or hell. And so it's important to realize that since we deserve to go to hell, that we need to be saved from going to hell. And the Bible tells us that God is love. God doesn't want any single person to go to hell. The Bible says that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come unto repentance. And repentance is a change of mind or a change of what you believe. And what we have to understand that we have to do, it's first based on what God did for us. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter number 5, verse 8, but God commended his love toward us in that while we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. So the Bible makes it clear that God loved us so much, he gave his son, Jesus Christ, to take the penalty and punishment for our sins. The Bible makes it clear that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, but not only is he the Son of God, he is God manifest in the flesh. The Bible teaches that God is a trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and these three persons are one God. And God the Father, he sent his Son, Jesus Christ, to this earth. He was born of the Virgin Mary. He became a man, just like you and I, and he lived on this earth, yet he was without sin. The Bible says that he was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. And so while he was on this earth, he did a lot of wonderful miracles. He healed people. He raised people from the dead, proving he was the Son of God. But he even said that he was the Son of God. And the Jews rejected him. They called him a blasphemer. They put a crown of thorns upon his head. They whipped him uh, through the Romans. And they even allowed the Romans to take him to the cross to be crucified. And the Bible makes it clear that Jesus Christ willingly died on the cross for our sins. And so what Jesus Christ did for us was a full penalty and payment for us. After he died, the Bible makes it clear his soul descended down into hell for three days and three nights. And after those three days and three nights, he rose again. And the Bible makes it clear that this is the gospel. The gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And is the fact that he paid for every single sin for every single person. Now, this does not mean that everyone automatically goes to heaven. There is something we must do. The Bible says in Acts chapter number 16, it says, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And so the question's asked, what do I have to do to be saved? And the answer in Acts chapter number 16 is this. And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. So according to the Bible, the only thing you have to do to be saved is to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what this means is it means to trust. It does not mean a, a mere acknowledgement of Christ's existence, but rather it's a placing of your full trust in Jesus' sacrifice to take the penalty and punishment for your sins. If I were to say there was a police officer over here and that he exists, that doesn't mean I necessarily trust him. And a lot of people, if you ask them, do they believe Jesus exists, they will say yes. But if you ask them why they're going to heaven, they say, oh, I'm such a good person. I go to church, I read the Bible, I help people or I've turned from this in, or now I'm living a good life, now I've been baptized. All those things are mentioned in the Bible as being good things to try and strive for. But ultimately that points to the person putting their trust in what they do and in themselves. In order to be saved, they have to transfer that trust to what Christ already did for them, his death, burial, and resurrection, and believe that that's what paid for all of their sins. The Bible makes it clear in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, 
but have everlasting life. So the Bible makes it clear that all you have to do is believe in what Jesus did, not in yourself. The Bible says if you do believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you should not perish, meaning you can't go to hell, because you have everlasting life. Now that's forever. It can never end. The moment you have it, you're saved forever. The Bible makes it clear that it's a one-time event that after you've trusted in Christ, you could never lose your salvation. That's what the good news is. That's what the gospel declares. The Bible even says that when you believe, you become a child of God. In John chapter number one, verse 12, the Bible says, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe in his name. So according to the Bible, if you believe in Jesus Christ, you become a child of God. And just like your physical parents will always be your physical parents, after you trusted Christ as your Savior, God the Father will always be your Heavenly Father. There's nothing you could do to change that. Now, if you were to do something terrible, you know, break your parents' rules, even commit a horrible crime, you know, maybe you steal something, maybe you commit uh, murder even, the Bible makes it clear, just as your physical parents would never change, your Father in Heaven would still never change. That does not mean that God would not be disappointed, that God would not punish you on this earth very severely, but it does mean that you would always be a son and nothing could separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So according to the Bible, once you're saved, you're always saved. The Bible also says in Romans chapter number six, verse 23, it says, for the wage of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So the moment someone believes in Jesus Christ, they're a son of God, and the Bible says it's a gift. Eternal life is something that's free because Jesus Christ already bought and paid for it. All you have to do is simply receive it. Now, if I told you I wanted to give you my Bible today as a free gift, but you have to give me $100, that wouldn't be a gift. If I said, hey, I'd like to give you my Bible, but you have to go wash my car, that wouldn't be a gift either because now you're working for it. And in the same way, God is not asking for you to go to church, read the Bible, or get baptized, or receive eternal life. Otherwise, it would never be a gift. He wants you to simply receive it by faith one time. And the Bible makes it clear why this is important. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, the Bible says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So according to the Bible, salvation is not something we can boast or brag in. It's by grace that we're saved. Grace is unmerited favor. It's not something that we deserve. I actually deserve to go to hell for my sins. But the Bible says by God's grace I can go to heaven and I'm saved through my faith. Now the Bible says it's not based on myself, it's not based on what my parents are, it's not based on what church I go to. It's based on one thing and that's me trusting Jesus Christ. It even says it's not of works. This means all the good that I've done in my life or tried to help people or done anything would add nothing to my salvation. Otherwise I could brag to you today, I could say, oh of course I'm going to heaven because I'm such a good person, I go to church, I read the Bible. But the Bible says that we simply trust what Christ did, His death, burial, and resurrection, and He gets all the honor, and He gets all the glory for our salvation. Now, the last thing I want to show you is the Bible tells us how someone can believe on the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved. If you believe what I've just showed you, then I'm going to also show you from the Bible how you could actually believe to be saved. In order to fully understand what it means to believe, you have to realize that we're all sinners. And not just sinners, but we're sinners deserving of hell. But God doesn't want us to go there. His Son, Jesus Christ, took the full penalty and payment for us by dying on the cross, was buried, and rose again. And the Bible makes it clear there's only one thing we have to do to be saved. That's trusting Jesus Christ. And once someone's trusted Christ, they're saved forever. Now the Bible says in Romans chapter number 10, the way someone believes, and verse 9, that it says, If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So the Bible says if you actually believe what I showed you, and you've changed your mind and you're now ready to trust Christ, that all you would need to simply do is confess and tell the Lord that that's what you believe, and by the faith in your heart, you would be saved. The Bible makes it clear that if I just prayed and asked God to save me, but I didn't really believe in Him, that would never save me, even if I prayed every day. Or if I prayed and asked God to save me, but I thought being a good person, going to church, getting baptized would get me saved, that would not be the right belief, and my heart would not have its faith in Christ, and I would not be saved. Or if I thought I could lose my salvation, I'm ultimately not trusting what Christ did for me. I'm trusting myself to be good in the future. And that also would not be the right faith. So in order to be saved, you have to put all of your faith in what Christ already did for you. Now, if that's something you've changed your mind on and you want to put your faith in Jesus Christ, I would like to give you some words that you could repeat with me 
and pray to God and tell him that you actually believe in him so you could know you're saved. Now know that words don't simply save you, it's the faith in your heart. But if you actually believe this, I would just implore you to pray with me right now. Dear Heavenly Father, I know that I'm a sinner and I deserve to go to hell. But I believe that you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for all my sins. He was buried and rose again. Please save me and give me eternal life. I'm only trusting in your son, not my works. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Now, if you just prayed that prayer and you meant it from your heart, the Bible says that you can know you're saved, not because you said some special prayer, but because you put your faith in what Christ did for you. The Bible makes it clear that you're saved one time and that you're always saved beyond that. Now what you need to do is you need to get baptized. You need to get into a good Bible-believing church that uses the King James Bible. And you need to also share with others the same gospel message that I just shared with you. God bless you and have a great day.